When Honehara Wera was elected to represent the people of Te Tai Tokerau in 2005, he was determined to take his activism to Parliament. And during his nine years there, that's exactly what he did. In 1868, the first Māori MPs entered New Zealand's House of Representatives. Today, there have never been more Māori in Parliament. They spanned the political and cultural spectrum and continue to leave an indelible mark on our political landscape. In this series, we'll explore the legacies of former Māori MPs as they speak about their time in politics. I'm Mikey Sherman, political reporter. This is Matangiraya. Happy are those who dream dreams and are prepared to pay the price to make those dreams come true. Hone, pani, tamati, wakanene, harawira hau, kia ora tato. I thought we might start with me running through a little bit of your resume. Leader, Hetawa, Auckland University. Leader and spokesperson, Waitangi Action Committee. Leader, Patu Squad, Springbok Tour. Organiser, Kotahi Tangahikoi, Tsuranga Waiwai, Tu Waitangi. Member, Nga Tamatoa. Supported Ngati Fatua during Bastion Point occupation. Founding member, Kawariki. And leader, Foshaw and Seabed Hikoi. That is quite remarkable. And an old boy of St. Stephen's. And an old boy of St. Stephen's. Which makes it even more remarkable. I mean, those were never just me. They were always uh, uh, a collective of people, a, a core of people and a, a collective and some really, really good people involved in that as well. So the Foreshawn Seabed March, that was something we, we organised from our end, but uh, required the support of activists all around the country to make it happen. So it was never just me. Mm. You guys were quite a force. What was it like? there with your mates on the front line of protests for Tino Rangatiratanga? Well, in our younger days, I know this sounds mm, arrogant, but we were really bulletproof, eh? We could not be told we were wrong. We believed absolutely in what we did, which meant we got offside with a lot of people, including a lot of our own people, a lot of our own old people. But in those days, there was a demand for change. And we just were part of that. And we weren't, we weren't the ones who started it. I mean, we were just part of a, of a changing of the guard in the world, I think. Indigenous people, people of colour, you know, the, the Black Panthers in, in the United States and the Polynesian Panthers here, the rise of the American Indian movement and the rise of Ngā Tamatoa. It was a changing of the world and we just happened to be a part of that, yeah. Tell me about, you know, where and when that fire in your belly began. You, you never really noticed it, but, but Mum brought us up that way. And I never knew that until I, you know, I talked to some of the old boys from St. Stephen's. They tell me I was always like that, but I didn't know. I just thought that I was like everybody else, but clearly I wasn't. Yeah, so Mum was always very, very forthright in uh, her belief in Māori rights, our rights under the treaty, our rights to our lands. Mum was the person within our whānau who was the, the leader. And uh, it just became part of our role in life to continue. The St. Stephen's experience added to that because I think when, when, when you're there, you grow up to believe that leadership is a natural part of your life, that uh, you're there because you are expected to play a role in the leadership of your people. 
And I think that and that historical political upbringing, knowing Sid and Hana and, and Mum, Tauda Eruira, all of those sorts of people from back in those days, yeah, they just, I guess, just came to pass. And then along came Hilda, of course. Of course. And uh, she uh, was way more political, way earlier than I was. I was still a, a boy out of St. Stephen's who really didn't know that much. Hilda, of course, was living that life in Ota at Hillary College, surrounded by some other very strong people, Marama Davidson's father, Lauri Paratin, and others. So, you know, when it became clear to me that uh, she was where I wanted to be, then um, it just made that, that move that much easier. Kia ora. You mentioned your mum yep. uh, there. Yep. Uh, it's Ikana Kiam Hia Tuki Aya. Ah, she sure was a yeah. pioneer and a, and a trailblazer mm. for Tino Rangatiratanga. But I'm interested to know about the relationship that you shared with her as mother and son. Oh, I'd like to tell you that I was her favourite son, but all my brothers will hear this and give me a hiding later. <laughs> <laughs> she never treated any of us really like we were anything special. I actually, tr- she treated us, here's how she treated us. My, my baby sister, or my niece, but my baby sister, came home from school and I saw her report, which had come back and gone back to school and been signed off and come back, that the teacher hadn't been that complimentary about how my sister was going at school. And my mum had written something in there which always reminded me that that's how she raised us. She wrote back to the teacher to say, be thankful for the opportunity to teach one of the best children you will ever meet. That's how mum used to treat us, you know what I mean? So. She was always there for us, always supporting us and what it was we were doing. Us older ones, we all had Māori names and every single one of our friends when we were going to school all had Pākehā names. But mum used to say to us, when I asked her, I actually asked her once, she said, it's because they don't yet know who they are. Mm. And what about your father? What influence did he have on you as a young person? He was a really nice man, eh? a a gentleman, my, my dad. He went away to the war. He lost a lung and he eventually developed emphysema and was on oxygen in his later days. But he raised us in a really, really nice way. He was always supportive of the things we did. Never, ever hit us to to my mum's displeasure. You're going to get it. And we'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always uh, gentle with us, always positive with us, always helping us with our, the things that we had to do, yeah. Nice man. And he passed away when you were just 21 years old? Yeah, about that year, I think 1976. How was that for your mum and for you as a young man still at that time? Uh, I was in Australia at the time and I came back and stayed back. It wasn't, wasn't a major, in fact, it, I never really noticed it until later in my life that there, there was often times I would have liked to have, you know, talked to my dad about different things and he wasn't there. So, yeah, that... That I noticed, but that was a bit later, rather than at the time. You, you just thought that, um, I just thought that it was part of life. I missed him, I was sad, but I never really understood how much I missed him until later. Mm. After St Stephen's, Hone enrolled at Auckland University, developing a public profile for his activism. Firstly, as the leader of He Taua, who confronted engineering students over their annual haka performance, and later as leader of the Patu Squad, opposing the 1981 Springbok Tour. And I want to talk to you about uh, some of those experiences, Patu Squad and the Springbok Tour. What was that like? Well, yeah, we were involved in the Springbok Tour, you know, from, from early on. We went along, used along go along to those heart meetings that they used to have at the TUC, Trade Union Centre. And right from before the tour started, I kind of knew that we would operate differently. We'd go to those meetings and there's a lot of energy, a lot of fire, a lot of passion, but a lot of pakis. And so they were seeing things as an anti-apartheid thing. For, for a lot of us in the room, we were fighting apartheid, but also using it as an opportunity to strike a blow against racism here in this country. And that's what it was for, for a lot of us. Our apartheid, our racism right, was right here at home. So we operated kind of differently. We, 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 we would see what the plan was, and then we would try to understand what our role within that plan was. 
And I, it, that happened, I guess, most noticeably when we went to Hamilton. We went down as a group from Otara. We stayed together during the whole activity and we left together. That unity we built from understanding that we were part of this, but our own part. And so as we got towards the end of the tour, I recognised also that it was a bit like the Māori Battalion. Uh, I remember something of my grandfather's making a note before the Second World War, because he'd been to the first as well as the second, that uh, if, if Māori ever go to war again, they need to go together. They need to feel that they're with one another. And that's what the Patu squad was an opportunity for us to feel like we were with others that we knew, that we believed in, that we could trust. And not just us as Māori, uh, Pacific Islanders as well. Put us on the front line in Hamilton with you. What were the scenes like for you guys? Well, we went with helmets for starters. That's the first thing. And a lot of the parking people saying, why do you do that? These are New Zealand police is not going to hurt you. Did it? Yeah, whatever. But we knew different. And I made sure that we weren't in the front line. I didn't want us to be identifiably on the front, but we were in the second line so that when she made the call, we could make sure that we moved. So yeah, and then, then actually getting onto the field, and we got onto the field, and all of the parkers were with us, and they go, oh, we did it, we did it, we did it, and they were all happy, happy, you know, we shall overcome that, 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 that kind of thing. And I stood up on my tiptoes and looked across, and I thought, and then I looked around the whole field, and I thought, ooh, there's <laughs> not a lot of us here. So yeah, that was, that was kind of scary, realising that if they'd, if they'd come on, we would have got absolutely smashed. But um, we stuck it out. And yeah, when we finally got off, and all the people in the stands, we called them protons, and they were just boozed, and they had picket fences, and they had bottles, and they had rocks, and they were just smashing everybody as we were trying to get out through the, that gap. That was, that was kind of scary. So we managed to stay together, shepherd everybody out, and then we stayed, I, I got all of our guys, to stay back so that all of our lot were here and the back line was a line from Otara. Mm -hmm. And I felt really good as all of the protons came streaming out after us, all they could see was a line of um, dark complexion ch chappies and so they were a bit hesitant about moving, so moving on us, so yeah. Harawira remained active throughout the 80s and 90s as a voice for Tinoranga Tiratanga, but it was the 2004 foreshore and seabed issue that saw Harawira pull on his marching boots again to lead a movement to national prominence. It was calls cool, from all around the country, eh? You know, we've got to do something, we've got to do And then I started hearing from brothers around the country that people were preparing to, like, um, block the beaches, which wasn't too bad, but then I started hearing words that they were going to uh, burn down Ministry of Fisheries buildings, that they were going to attack anybody who came on the beaches. You know, it became clear that things were going to get really quite ugly and we needed to be doing something. And then it wasn't us. I think Kahungunu and Te Arawa talked about marching to, to Wellington. So a group of us met and as we talked through the options, that particular night, it became clear to me we were marching. So I just found out, when do we have to be in Wellington? OK. If we're in Wellington on that day, that means we're in Wellington the night before so we can get to Parliament. If we're in Wellington the night before, where are we the night before that? Just work my way all the way back up home. And once I made that list, I got a list of all of the people I knew who were activists, who lived in those areas, I contacted them, and I said, look, we're going to have a conference call. I need to know that if, if we announce when we get to your town, you're going to, you're going to organise things, venues for any speeches, places to stay, kai to eat, arrangements with the police, exits, all that kind of stuff. So everybody agreed. And so we announced that we were going to, we were going to do it. I remember doing an interview, I think, with Shane Taurima, and um, he saying to me, so how many people do you think will get to Wellington? I said, well, I think if it's just me, Mangu, and my missus, I'll be kind of embarrassed. I said, if there's a couple of hundred, I'll be happy. And as, as what happened. Tens and Tens of thousands. thousands. Yeah, absolutely. 
And we saw those scenes yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Had you ever seen that level of engagement from Māori over your years of protest? No, 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 not at all. Um, the funniest thing was out here on the courtyard when a, I think Inspector Wally Homer walked up and shook my hand. I said, what's that for? He said, you ought to be proud of yourself. 50,000 people, 1,000 kilometres, not on arrest. I'd never thought of it like that, of course. But really, just absolute passion. And, and I think that that was, the, that was the fire that lit the Māori Party. Uh, because I know that there'd been meetings to try and get a Māori Party started before the march. I'd been invited to a couple, no, 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 I'm busy. But once we got to one and some bright spark, I don't know who it was, was handing out these cards. Join the Māori Party, join the Māori Party. So they, they passed out tens of thousands, of course. And uh, that's another funny thing. I knew then, on March the 6th, the very next day, I knew that day that there would be a Māori Party. I would be the candidate for Taitukaro, and I would be going to Parliament September the 17th next year, the following year. And that's exactly what happened. Harawira defeating Labour MP Dover Samuels in Te Tai Tokerau. While Labour held the Treasury benches, the Māori Party managed to take four of the seven Māori seats. So those um, first few years with the Māori Party, they must have been happy ones. They were great years. They were absolutely great years. As issues came up, and I, I, I get the opportunity to speak in Parliament on these, on these different issues, um, Helen Lay used to write all everybody's speeches, eh? Wonderful speech, right? Absolutely wonderful. So she'd write all my write my speech and I'd look at it and go, oh yeah. So I'd take all of the facts out that she wanted to push and then I'd write my own story. And so I noticed that my speeches were all from what I understood as an activist. You know what I mean? It was and it was activism that was driving my career as an MP. Uh, my love for Kopapa Māori and, and for my colleagues and stuff, but um, yeah, I, I, I remained an activist even when I was here. Did you support going into coalition with National and how much interaction did you have with them? Oh no, I didn't. <laughs> of course I did. Look, there was a, a big and deep discussion within the Māori Party, Māori Party leadership. We had to go back and talk to all of our people about the why, etc, etc, etc. I was as integral a part of those discussions as Tariana and Pete and Te Uruba. It's not, you know, I don't hold them responsible for that. That was an us decision. The parting of the ways came because I felt that we were becoming a little too close to the National Party. I just felt that we were getting a little too close and we needed separation. We needed our people to see that we could have a relationship with anybody but we would always be our own voice. And I felt that in, I was starting to see too much influence from National in the decisions that we were making. And you couldn't, you couldn't tolerate it well, any no, longer? Well, I mean, I'm an activist. It's not, not my role to sit back and, and, and accept those things. It's to say things about it and hopefully convince others to, to um, change course. In, in the end, we, we, we came, to a, came to a parting of the ways. That was kind of sad, but I, yeah, that, that's just, that just happened. I don't blame anybody for that. I have great love for Pete, for, for Tariana. I, I, I've always had the greatest respect for, for Tanya and love for her as well. So, yeah, like I say, the things you did in the past, don't let those determine your future always. Just understand who you are, what your role is, and be comfortable in the relationship that you have with people. In 2011, Harawira's relationship with his fellow Māori Party MPs became acrimonious after he gave an interview criticising their relationship with National. A complaint laid with the party's disciplinary committee was upheld and recommended Harawira's expulsion. Harawira quit. Do you ever regret, though, leaving the Māori Party? No, not for one second. Not for one second. I think it was necessary. I think it was necessary for the Māori Party and I certainly think it was necessary for me. And so what then was it like to lead mana and to see mana grow? Well, here's the funny thing, eh? I wasn't even, I wasn't even planning on starting mana. And then Matt McCartan comes to see me and he says to me, 
Hone, you don't want to serve out the rest of your political career sitting up in the back corner. No, I don't. But that's what you will be remembered for as the man who got sat in the back corner until Parliament was over and then you were gone. He said, you need to resign from Parliament and relaunch yourself with a new movement true to the principles that you believe. And I talked about that with, with Hilda and others and they, they understood instantly the importance of it. That, you know, the, the major separation which would come from my relationship with Māori Party was one of the downsides to that, but it was an important part, I think, of, of, of growth at that time. So, kind of tough though. I, you know, the minute I resigned from Parliament, they cut off everything. My wages, my entitlements and everything. And I couldn't even get on the dole. You can't, even, you can't go, go from being MP to adult, so for the length of my campaign, I don't know how many months it was, uh, I had absolutely nothing to do it on. But yeah, it just, ma it just made it easier to, to build a movement committed to those sorts of principles, act principles of activism. When you came back into Parliament in 2011 as the mana leader, what were your relationships like with the Māori Party MPs? Strained. I recall Labour gave me the opportunity when I came back into the House to speak to the Maccabill, Marine Areas and Coastal, or whatever, whatever, bloody bill, mm -hmm. the Nationals version of uh, the Foreshore and Seabed. And I was hugely critical of it. And I'm glad I was. And I know that that, that, that was hard on my Māori Party colleagues. Yeah, it meant a strained relationship for a period of time. And it's what, a polite way of putting it. And what's the unpolite version? Oh, we never sent each other ugly texts or emails or, or that, but you know, the Māori way of, of letting somebody know you're really pissed off with them is just to give them the cold shoulder. Eh? <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of like it. I mean, I remember one of the funniest things, I, I don't like to focus too much on that stuff. I remember one of the funniest things, I was sitting outside Parliament and during a break on, in my suit and everything. And Anadu Mill comes along down the bottom. There's nobody there, just me on the steps of Parliament. And he stops and takes a photo. He says, hey, bro, what's that for? He says, I just wanted to get a shot of the Mana Caucus in action. <laughs> yeah, so being on my own was, was kind of tough. But I never felt it a burden. You know, it was just, it was just a challenge. I missed the, the resource capacity that came with the team. I missed the relationships. And I'm glad that they've been bigger than the politics, that we are as Māori now with one another as we were before. And were you proud to be in Parliament, to be that voice for Te Pani Me Te Rawakore? There wasn't any other. There wasn't another voice. I mean, the Feed the Kids Bill was, was the classic expression of that. Eh? You can talk major housing strategies, you can talk financial crises, you can talk anything you like, um, you know, training and development and everything else. But at the start, if you as a society are not even good enough to feed your kids, then what are you really? What are you really? So, yeah, that Pani Me Te Rawakore was already part of my activist roots, but seeing that as an opportunity to try and make that a political campaign was important to me because if I'm going to be remembered for anything, you know, that, that tobacco thing, I mean, I know, I know Tati uh, was the minister who put it through, but even Tati knows that it was a lot of the work that I did in the lead up to that. And I'm more than happy that Tati gets the credit for it because she was the minister and she, she was the person who pushed that through. But um, those things, um, and even getting arrested in Glen Innes, you know, in GI, trying to stop those houses being taken away from the, from the whanau over there, you know, those... That just part of that activist background, eh? To if you're going to say something, then do something. Don't just, don't just, don't just be talking. We hear a lot about the argument: it's better to be inside the tent than outside. How do you explain your position on that? Yeah, um, I think I think there's a role for inside. Uh, I think there's a role for outside. Uh, if I ever was to come back here, I'd come back exactly the same. I'd still be an activist. And I'd use this platform the, exactly the way I used it last time. Every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we'd cross the bridge and if I had something to say, the nation's media was here. 
and I'd say it. And I'd, I'd use it to highlight issues, whether it was uh, uh, land issues, whether it was treaty issues, whether it was issues of racism. I'd use that, that platform every single time because you don't ever get that platform from, from anywhere else. For me, that's what that role was. And then you have, have a role when you're not there, which is to continue to build on those sorts of things that you talked about, yeah. You certainly used your platform, mm. especially with the media, well. You used lots of colourful language at times yeah. as well. Racist bastard, yep. pricks, yep. white mother yep. Do you ever wish you had phrased it differently? Do you suppose anybody would have noticed? I suspect not. But what I said got noticed in about in about 20 seconds. Uh, it got a lot of people really, really angry. Also got a lot of people really, really glad that, that I was saying it. So when you're in those positions, the media never has the time to sit and talk to you. Well, here we are, but this is 100 years later. But at the time, they don't, they don't give you the opportunity to explain in depth your position. Knowing that, you understand what your soundbite time is, you focus your attention on capturing the public attention with that soundbite. And, and believe me, if every one of those words was a polite word, chances are they may not notice. But when I used to speak the way I used to speak, absolutely guaranteed it would be leading the six o'clock news that night. Provocative protest. Yeah, I mean, that's the role of protest. Done me, Haka. And again, that's that whole thing about learning from others and being part of it. He used to say to us, the role of protest is to challenge people's thinking, to force them to look at what you're doing and ask themselves, why is he doing that? What does that mean to me? What could that mean to us? So Dunn was always really strong on that, and I remember that always. And, uh, and then I used to try and do a lot of media myself during my protest days, and I knew... I knew the importance of the soundbite, that if your soundbite was catchy, and if it wasn't going to be catchy, noticeable, then uh, go, and go hard. But some of Harawira's catchy soundbites came back to haunt him. During a private email exchange with consultant Buddy Mikaire, Harawira used an expletive to describe the furore over a side trip he took with his wife while on parliamentary business. Mikaire made the email public. Sometimes that language did get you into hot water when you were criticised for meeting up with your wife in Paris. As it happens, but, if I go back, if I go back, let's say you were my, my wife, and we were in Belgium, and I said, shit, I'm, we're never going to get here to back, to back this close again. Let's take the day off and go to Paris. You would have said, yeah, let's do it. And I'm glad I did it, absolutely glad. I will never get to go to Paris again with my darling. So I'm glad I did it. I couldn't care less what the, what the email said. Uh, I had to pay $1,000 for the day off or something like that. Who cares? Mm. Who cares? I got to spend a day in Paris with my darling. Was it hoha or, or mamai for you that that moment for the two of you and for your darling was dragged into the media oh, like that? in the end. That's an understanding of what you and I know, which is that um, white media in this country is still run by white racist mother I mean, somebody from Stuff said that just the other day. And I mean, I said this, what, 10 or so years ago. Absolutely. That, that was my reality. That was my reality at best in, our reality at best in point, our reality, Springbok to our reality and all of those things which is that the media is unlikely to be on your side. So you have to do other things to try to capture the imagination of those you're trying to reach. Mm. But is our media racist? Ha, 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 absolutely. And throughout it all, mm. we spoke about your wife, Hilda. Yeah. And I want to talk about her because she has been a huge rock, solid yeah, yeah. support, yeah, yeah. aroha, everything yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about Hilda. Oh, all the women, all the women around the country know that to be true, they, because they know Hilda. Her and her brothers and sisters were brought up, um, her father's English, her mother is Māori from Ngāti Hawa and Whangapē, 
and they were brought up to be independent, not to rely on others, to think for themselves, to be strong for themselves. And in, in different ways, they all lead in the fields in which they've ch chosen to be involved. So she was already that way when I met her, uh, and she always has been. She, in fact, in that, she's never really changed. Her politics in 2000 are exactly the same as they were in 19, I imagine, in 1970. I met her in 1973, but yeah, she's always been a very strong, very Māori, very Māori woman presence. And uh, that meant that her and my mum <laughs> got on famously well, right from day dot. And, uh, that's the other thing that became clear to me. Okay, my mom's cool, Hilda's cool, I'm in. Oh, I'm on the right road here. And she's always provided that leadership in the political activities we've always been involved in together, always. Uh, the things we have done before we moved home from Otara, and that all of the things that we've done since we've been home, she has been part and parcel of that whole journey. Always happy to be in the background, except that the kura where she had to lead, where we required that she lead. You know, she just comes through a quadruple bypass heart attack. She's back on the water. She's uh, in the nationals for the W1s. She's out there hammering the water with her with her team. She's at home at the moment uh, with the mokopunas. So yeah, life is life is wonderful, and I'm a lucky man. Forty-seven years married. How yeah, well, 47 years together. Yeah, yeah. She, she likes to yeah. tell everybody and when they say, oh, wow, 47 years, what's it been like? You know, the line she used to say was, oh, the last two haven't been too bad. Yeah, I, I really don't know. You have to ask her what it's, what it's really been like. Would have been up and down, you know, like, I mean, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not the best father, I'm not the best husband, I'm not the best person in the world, um, but she's always been there always been there for me, and not always positively so either. I mean, when she knew I was wrong, she she had ways of letting me know without even telling me off. You know, just the way she can stand up from our talking or, or any, it just a, a little comment just reminds me, you're a little off track here, son. Mm. Mm. In 2014, after three years as a solo MP, Harawira decided it was time to make a big play, joining forces with controversial internet tycoon Kim.com to form the Internet Mana Party. Along with high-profile left-wing figures John Minto and Laila Hare. I want to talk about your final moments in this place in Parliament. Sure. 2014, yeah. you decide to hook up with the internet party, Kim.com. Yeah. Why? A couple of reasons, um, but the main reason being, am I going to come back in here by myself? Or am I going to try and do something to change the game? And then I started thinking about what would be a game changer? Doing a deal with the Māori Party or with the Greens or with somebody else is not what you call a game changer, just be tweaking things. So I thought, Let's, let's get out there. And then Kim.com came along, and his, his thing was about the internet party. So I met with him, I said, look, you have to know that whatever we do, nothing that I do for mana will ever change. Uh, the, the principles that mana was founded on uh, must stay the same. Uh, the policies of mana won't change. And uh, you know, whoever your candidate's gonna be, good luck to them and the things that they believe in, I didn't want to see anything change for us. So. That was the basis of the relationship and, and those things stayed. We ended up doing spectacularly well, right up until about two or three weeks out. I think we're up about 3.6%. But then Kim.com, who we thought was going to step back and let uh, Layla lead the charge for the internet party right to the finish line, we expected a, a, a tailing off, but we didn't expect him to just keep going with what he wanted. In the end, he wouldn't let go. He kept going. He just wanted to attack uh, the government, John Key and them, I think, for what was a really ugly incident, them pouncing on his house and his whanau and all of that, using, using the Americans. Um, but still, he wouldn't let that go. And that ended up with our collective 
party vote diving through the floor. So it was, uh, ended up being death. Hmm. Unfortunate. Um, could I have won the Taitukero seat just uh, as mana in uh, 2014? I suspect I could have, but my aim was to try to change that game from just being one person from Taitukero to being a number of people in back in the house. You know, strong, you know, like Leila Hari, uh, John Minto, I sincerely hoped would, would get in. I wanted wanted to bring in people with strong uh, activist roots as well. Uh, in the end, it, it didn't happen. It was unfortunate. Mm. Were you angry with Kim.com that he cost you that election? Oh, not angry, pissed off. Pissed off, but I mean, not angry. I mean, I remember the, the, the very next morning after, after I lost, Hilda waking me up at seven o'clock, said, get up, get your paddle, we're going. And we are on the lake half an hour later. And she just up and down, keep paddling, keep paddling. She killed me. But I mean, that brought me back instantly to reality, which is, I have a whanau at home, I have a lake here. Those things will never change. So I very quickly got over that, but a lot of others didn't. And that was kind of sad. But yeah, and then I decided to, to get back into things at home. Because what is that feeling like when you are waiting for those election results to come in and they don't go your way? Well, that was, again, that was a strange thing. I mean, I was lucky enough that I was back home. Uh, I, I was surrounded by whanau, and in particular, two of my mokopunas, uh, Maioha and Te uh, They were with me that night, as well as everybody else. But, oh, you know, just having them with you in the good times and in the bad times means nothing else in the world can ever be that bad. You know what I mean? Nothing else in the world matters as long as you've got, you know, the love of your mokos and you've got your love for your mokos and they are there with you. So I never really went through, I, I understand it really was quite intense for Te Urudua and, uh, you know, Aroha for the brother. Um, I remember, I remember getting a call asking me to go back, come down and do the TV the next day. I says, oh, I'm happy to come down if I win. <laughs> so if I lose, don't expect, I'm not coming down. I mean, what the hell for? You know, I'm going to get on with life, so, yeah. Uh, I do want to ask you about the, the, the merger with the Internet Party. Yeah. How did you think Māori would respond to that? How did you expect them to, to view that? Uh, in hindsight, our, our ability to communicate the importance of that uh, was unsuccessful. I have no doubt that if we'd won, then I would have had plenty of time to, to you know, tour the country, explain to them the whys, the hows, the importance of mana, staying the way it was. In, but looking back now, I can see that uh, we didn't do a good job of explaining that to our people. I hear some MPs say stuff like, oh, the people don't understand what we're trying to do. And that's an arrogant attitude, really. I always think that that's an arrogant attitude. It's never the people who are at fault in that situation when you want, when they, they vote for you or they don't, for you, don't vote for you. They are never at fault. Your ability to communicate your message is either good or bad. And in this case, it was bad. Uh, people didn't understand it. A lot of Māori still don't understand it. And um, that's cool. That's cool. And so you're out of Parliament, yep. and then in 2016, a glimmer of hope, you sit down with the Māori Party for bacon and eggs. Oh, yeah. Oh, with Tuku, yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, that was great. That did a lot, I think, to heal publicly the rift. You have to know this, and all of that time, I've always got on really, really well with uh, Māori Party people up and down the country, even when I was in Mana. I mean, I'd go, I'd go places and some queer, you know, then the Māori Party t-shirts would come over and clip my ears and then give me a big cuddle, you know? That relationship never, ever died because they knew that my heart was always Māori, always. Uh, the mana movement was a way to express another part of who we were. But that, that opportunity to try and uh, make something happen, I think it was, 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 was worth the effort. Absolutely it was worth the effort. Did you leave it too late? Um, possibly. Could we have managed it better? Definitely. Was it worth a shot? Absolutely. Would you do it again? Well, I don't know that there's a need to anymore. I mean, I'm looking at the way in which 
the Māori Party ran their campaign in an absolute red tsunami, which just killed everybody. It wiped, wiped out national land as well. And Māori have always gone that way when Labour's rolling. Māori go Labour, big time. The fact that <laughs> the cowboy from off the coast, Rawiri Waititi, could, could beat that, could survive, you know, could get his head above the tsunami and win his seat was, was absolutely amazing. And that was the power of their campaign. Campaign strategy, individually doing what it, what it was that they felt was important to win, but a really powerful strategy, good comms, good connection, good engagement with the rangatahi for the future. I thought they did that well. And they launched early. They came to see me. I got approached by a whole host of people uh, in, the, in the run up to it, but it wasn't going to work for me. In the end, I, I had to write, send them a note. I think it might have been the day, the day of the lockdown in, in, in early March to say, I really can't. I've committed. I'm committed to the things that I have to do at home. And as it happened, at the end of lockdown, boom, Hilda has, has her heart attack. So boom, that took me completely out of action as well for the next, you know, almost right up to the election. So I'm glad I didn't. Is there a future for mana? Oh, I'm actually talking to uh, my mana crew at the moment about are you happy with where the Māori Party is going? Are we comfortable that that's the sorts of things that we'd want to be supporting? Because if there is a, a, a demand to continue, I'm up for it, but I'm just as happy to support what is happening within the Māori Party right now. For Hone Harawera, sure. what do you hope will be your political legacy? Really that um, the activism that I was noted for before I came in, uh, was the activism that I continued with while I was in and is the activism which is the basis of the things that I do even since then. And border control, all of those sorts of things, they are part and parcel of who I am. You know, if, if government isn't going to step up and protect our people during COVID, we'll do it ourselves. Those things are more important to me and always will be than uh, my parliamentary career. Activism and fighting for the rights of our people to the to the poor. Tēnā koe. Kia Kā nui te mihi, kia irirangi te motu, 